Hello and welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2022. This year it's brought to you with the generous help of our platinum supporters Intopia and Fable and our gold supporters Barrier Break, TPGI and UX for the win. A reminder that you'll find us on Twitter at ID24Conf is our account. If you have questions for our presenters, please do tweet them. You can use the hashtag ID24 and you can alternatively use the chat in the YouTube channel that we're broadcasting this live from. We'll ask those questions at the end of the session to our next presenters. Before we get to that, though, I'm very happy to welcome back another ID24 regular in the form of Crystal Preston Watson, who's my co-host. Crystal, do you want to take it from here? Thank you so much. And I am super excited because um, of our next two presenters, Svia uh, and Laura. They will be talking about 360 accessibility, um, accessible book publishing. So over to you both. Thank you. We're going to speak about accessible book publishing today. The work of accessible publishing often falls squarely on the shoulders of production staff. And this is a problem. In order to make meaningful progress on accessibility, the work of publishing inclusively must permeate a publishing house with the meaningful involvement of editors, designers, marketing, sales, legal, procurement, and customer service being critical pieces of the puzzle. In this talk, we will go through some accessible accessibility actions for everyone in the publishing industry. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the social benefits for publishers. Um, and this really means the benefits for readers ultimately. When books are accessible, society becomes more equitable and more balanced. Many people with print disabilities are unable to read most published books simply because the books have not been produced in the formats they can use. Um, the the uh, slide on the screen now is um, a, a, it's like a slice of HTML with a poop emoji in the middle meant to symbolize technical debt. So while the number of digital publications increases every day because of the technical debt created by the authoring tools that publishers use, many of these still cannot be accessed by the assistive technologies used by people with print disabilities. In theory, digital publishing should be a really a democratic boon for people with print disabilities, but in practice, it is absolutely not. And this is because of the authoring tools we use. Ensuring that your digital content from books and journals to websites to newsletters and catalogs is accessible means that you're doing all that you can to work toward a more inclusive society. Disability advocate Deborah Rue once said, accessibility allows us to tap into everyone's potential. I would adapt that quote to writing and publishing to say that accessible publishing helps us to find every reader. Um, the slide on the screen now is a picture from Nuit Blanche in Toronto, and it's um, a, a, a river of books sort of covering an entire roadway. We need to work to make river, the rivers of content that publishers produce accessible to all readers in a timely manner that gives readers choice in how to read. As outlined in the Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative's Introductory Guide to Inclusive Publishing, which is excellent, by the way, and is worth looking up. The World Intellectual Property Organization anticipates significant benefits for the countries in which books and other print materials are made universally accessible, including greater and more equal access to education through the provision of educational materials in accessible formats, the alleviation of poverty for people living with a print disability as a result of improved access to education and employment opportunities improved awareness by society of the challenges faced by people living with disability, improved social inclusion and cultural participation of people with print disabilities, and an increase in the contribution that people living with a disability are able to make to the national economy. Thanks, Laura. I'm gonna speak a little bit about the web accessibility maturity model. The image on the screen is some blocks going up steps or down steps. The concept of the maturity model is not unique to accessibility or publishing. 
It's a method of demonstrating who is responsible for progress across an organization or a project at each stage. Several accessibility maturity models have been proposed, and now the W3C is documenting an accessibility maturity model. The W3C accessibility maturity model is a guide for organizations to evaluate and improve their business processes to produce digital products that are accessible to all people. This maturity model, as well as those that preceded it, offers dimensions such as communications, support, and information and communication technology. There are proof points that are ways that the organization defines success and maturity stages ranging from inactive to optimized, as well as an assessment template. This might sound like a tremendous amount of work, but it is very helpful for speaking to executives and convincing people who pay for accessibility how far reaching it is. In my experience, this template can be adopted, adapted, excuse me, for use in adjacent areas like diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. Well, whose job is it anyway? One of the issues in the book publishing landscape is that accessibility work is siloed. And the slide on the screen shows a picture of some grain silos um, with the sky, blue sky above. The production department, or even just the ebook developer, should one exist in house, is meant to tackle accessibility. So, through the whole publishing workflow, it ends up at the end, and it's just the production person who's responsible for it. And this task is likely in addition to being the house's metadata person or the typesetter and maybe even the receptionist. This is a problem endemic to publishing and particularly indie publishing. Um, and that's that everyone is wearing three or four hats and often working for very low pay, which means that burnout and turnover are high and the accessibility knowledge base once developed rarely sticks around. And this is why if there's only one message you take from this talk, let it be this. It is everyone's job to think about and affect accessibility and inclusion. It's also critical to keep in mind that accessibility isn't a one and done effort. Accessibility is an ongoing transformation. So with those two things top of mind, let's dive into how accessibility is a part of every single person's remit in the publishing house. So let's start with the executives. And there's a picture here of a suit and tie with a nice pocket square. Often we see accessibility as a grassroots effort led by a group of devoted developers with little to no budget. For an, for an organization to truly become accessible, it needs to embrace accessibility from the top down as well as the bottom up. This can be challenging and often will start with just one caring executive who wants to help you change the world. So let's talk about operations. And, and a, a lot of this touches on the built environment, um, which may be not what you were thinking about from this talk, but it's really important. Um, so is your office space accessible? Um, there's an excellent chance you've had a look around and you're pretty sure it is. There's ramp access and a wheelchair bathroom stall. So we have all the bells and whistles. Accessibility in the built environment is much deeper and more nuanced than that. So some questions to consider. Is the is if the space is open plan, are there quiet spaces for people to focus? Are there automatic doors with wide doorways? Are lifts or elevators available as an option to stairs? If they're not located at main entrances, is there clean, clear signage? Is the washroom accessible? So wide stalls, automatic doors, handrails, some automation at the sink. Are the sink counters high enough to allow wheelchair users to reach the sink? And if they're not high enough, to, will the if they're not high enough, the wheelchair user will bump into the counter and it will be too far away to reach. Are there all gender and single stall bathrooms in the office or elsewhere in the building? If the latter, is the signage and communication about where these can be found very clear? If the bathrooms are stocked with menstrual products, is the signage gender neutral? Have you considered stocking all bathrooms with menstrual products, including the men's? If there's a kitchen lunchroom, are those sinks, counters, tables accessible for wheelchair users? Is your space scent free? Is public facing and internal signage clearly designed at a high height, obeying color contrast in plain language and including braille? Are desks adjustable and ergonomic? 
Does the space have door handles instead of doorknobs where possible? Are the floors flat, free of tripping hazards or obstacles for users of wheelchairs or other mobility devices? And finally, is your internal technology accessible? Organizing an office space around diverse needs, regardless of what you believe the needs of your current staff are, signals to employees and potential customers, for example, in the case of um, when a publisher has a bookstore, it, this signals an unwavering commitment to inclusivity. So now let's talk about authors. It's important to include writers of all types to ensure that we accurate, accurately represent the diverse population. Diversity includes people with disabilities, of course. When seeking authors, signing contracts, licensing with partners, it's important to make sure that we include authors with disabilities. The disability community has a saying, nothing about us without us. We cannot accurately represent the needs of the community without their input. Writers and illustrators can make disability representation a core effort. People need to see themselves and their peers in literature. Kids are curious about difference and roll with it when it's well represented. Normalize disability representation in all kinds of literature. The novelist David Mitchell says, it is through stories that we give shape to and understand the world. And historically, it has been through stories that we've first given shape to difference. Formatting manuscripts is currently a minefield. As this comic from Iva Chung illustrates, and this comic demonstrates um, people, um, uh, the first panel is people saying that a hotel room seems pretty clean. You'll see the hidden, hidden nastiness when you look at it under the black light, hit the switch, and then it shows all the microbes um, and disgustingness that you can see when you look at things under, under a black light. A lot of writers are tempted to typeset, quote unquote, their manuscript and word processing software causing all sorts of problems. Writers should consider formatting manuscripts cleanly using style sheets and embedded styling rigorously. Work with a hierarchy or navigation panel open so the structural hierarchy of a manuscript is applied as one moves through it. That navigation is critical to, print to the print disabled reading experience of any writing. If there are images, authors need to think about image descriptions from the start. The writer is the best person to describe imagery in the context of their own work. Then we're going to move on to editors and editorial. The work of producing accessible content in-house at publishers is, surprise, everyone's responsibility. The key to moving the needle on accessibility is to get editors invested. And the images on, on the screen now is just um, a chunk of Spanish writing with editorial markup. It's just an illustration of what um, editors do. So editorial could be putting hierarchy and structure into manuscripts from the beginning. They could mark language shifts so that developers at the other end of the workflow don't have to guess for the digital products. Um, and they should be harvesting image descriptions from things like instructions to illustrators or the author or the context of the image. The acquiring editor and legal team might wanna write accessible formats into publishing contracts and advocate with the author to collaborate with, for example, with third-party producers on a Braille transcription. And that's a nice segue into legal. This image shows scales. Um, this image shows scales. <laughs> Make sure your contracts are in an accessible format. Write accessible as well as digital formats into publishing contracts. Consider whether you need to include information about requirements for image descriptions in your contracts. Make sure that your legal team is aware of all current and pending legislation. Often legal teams like to review outward facing materials such as accessibility statements on websites and voluntary accessibility product templates or VPETs, which are documents that identify gaps and successes in accessibility on the platform or website measured against standards such as the web content accessibility guidelines that you should have for your systems and tools. Um, now I'm gonna talk about data. Um, publishers need to take accessibility seriously and they need to reflect that in the metadata that travels with their content. Write metadata that reflects the accessibility of your content. A lot of publishers use metadata services that really only skim the available fields 
and offer a precious few fields around accessibility metadata. It is a really good idea to push those aggregators to get more robust when it comes to accessibility descriptors. Advocate for change in the supply chain so that you can deliver accessibility metadata and cover image descriptions with your Onyx feeds. Onyx is the technology that publishers use to describe their books. Even if the metadata is not used now, embed it for the future. It is required for the European Accessibility Act and remediating metadata is painful and expensive. Let's do the work and flag content that meets accessibility standards. And also consider getting your digital publishing workflow certified accessible and embedding that information as well into your metadata. Also, do the work to make publisher websites accessible. At present, I don't think a single publisher in Canada, which is where I work, um, is including image descriptions on covers on their own websites. Audit the retail process from login to hitting the buy button to checking out. Making it easier, making it easy for consumers to buy one's book is a really good idea. Um, and now I'm going to move on to sales and marketing. There's a, an icon on the screen of a bullhorn with someone uh, with noise actively coming out of it. Um, so sales and marketing. Educate your sales and marketing staff about accessibility. Publishing inclusively is a sales point. Um, there's data from a few years ago from a Deloitte report that says that 87% of Canadian consumers say that they value inclusion and 92% of consumers are more likely to support a business that is both physically and digitally accessible. If you were here for the talk just before ours, there was a, a really nice wrap up at the end of the re business reasons to work accessibly. Um, you might wanna go back to Scott Dinkle's talk and look at that, it was terrific. Customers want to spend money on brands that are doing the work. Publishers should be sure to strut their stuff once they are ready. Tell marketing to shout it from the rooftops while also being careful to use image descriptions on social media. Customer service should be trained so that they can help a user with a screen reader um, with screen reader questions in the same way that they can help people find books. Don't ask a deaf blind user to send in a screenshot, for example. Add FAQs to your system so that your customer care team can answer some basic questions about accessibility. Plan accessible events. Book launches are often done on a shoestring at best, but creating safe and accessible spaces is not expensive. It just requires planning and thoughtfulness. Having a rant to the stage, even if it's not needed by the author or the um, host of an event, signals clearly your commitment to accessibility. Organizing an inclusive space lets all sorts of attendees know where you stand. It welcomes people with mobility devices, but also parents with strollers, someone on crutches, and the author's grandparent who can't negotiate stairs safely. It is a truism of this work that if you make something better for disabled people, it makes life better for everyone. Now. Sorry? Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2022, brought to you in partnership with our platinum supporters, Intopia and Fable, and our gold supporters, Barrier Break, TPGI, and UX for the Win. You can follow us on Twitter <laughs> at ID24Conf, and if you have any questions for the presenters, tweet them using the ID24 uh, hashtag into slide or post them in the YouTube chat for our QA at the end of the session. I'm joined by Jens. Uh, over to you, Jens. Uh, thank you, Ian. Next, we'll have Annabelle Weiner and I'm not sure what that was. Shall we carry on? Uh, yes, please carry on, uh, Laura. Okay. So it's a truism of this work that if you make something better for disabled people, it makes life better for everyone. Planning accessible spaces is a strong instance of that. Over to you, Svia.
roles on the accessibility and the user experience team has been to conduct more early user research with people with disabilities. Um, so we've been working with Fable, who's a sponsor of this um, recently, and Fable's a company that recruits people who use assistive technology for user research. And so we've been really excited. So sorry, everyone. We're having some technical difficulties. Green Green and I are hearing yeah, another stream. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. And oh. the reason we're doing this is because mm -hmm. accessibility conformance is. Sophia, Laura, can I just check that neither of you has the event playing in a browser so tucked out of the way somewhere? We are no. the I don't think so. Accessibility guidelines, but we also want to reach past compliance. I think you might do, Sophia, uh, when I mute you, it's oh. stopped coming across. Okay, I did have it. Uh, okay. I didn't realize I did. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> These things happen. Please, both of you, carry on. <laughs> okay, we're at technology, Sia, if you want to carry on with that section. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you, Laura. And my kids were also screaming in the background, so it was great to meet me. All right, technology. Um, your developers and engineers need to be trained to make sure that any website, app, or platform meets accessibility success criteria. This includes everything from customer, from customer sign into shopping carts, annotation to videos. It is common to use a third-party vendor to audit materials and provide a VPAT or comparable that can be a VPAT or comparable that can be provided to customers to tell them how accessible your materials are. Many universities and libraries will not purchase materials without these audits. Your technology team must have the capacity and ability and training and retraining to respond to these audits and updates, update materials accordingly. And I'll move on now to procurement. There's an image here of uh, an adding machine, I guess you'd call it. It's a calculator with the paper output. The accessibility journey starts before most of us have had a chance to get involved. What tools are you using to generate websites? What is your authoring environment like? Are these and other tools accessible to authors? Do they enable your authors to create accessible materials? Or do they generate blobs of XML that have to be transformed several times in order to be accessible? Are you involved in these decisions? How can you be involved in these decisions? How are these decisions even made? There are several checks that can be put in place to help you assess what you're buying. Check if the tool itself has an accessibility statement, a VPAT or equivalent, and how often it's updated. Ask for sample files that have been output from the, from the authoring tools. Test the tool yourself. Make sure your procurement team knows some basics about accessibility so that they can learn to ask the basic questions and understand the answers. Okay, this this um, last section is about collaboration, and this is really my um, publishing superpower: is learning how to collaborate with various players in this space. Um, collaborating, I, I will readily admit, makes me look good, um, and it makes the publishing process look good. Um, so, I'll, I'll I'll fill you in on some of these things that I've figured out over the years. All publishers should be prioritizing collaboration with various organizations that support accessible publishing. In Canada, where I work, there are two um, organizations, the National Network for Equitable Library Services, also known as NELS, and then ELS, and the Center for Equitable Library Access, uh, also known as CELA, C-E-L-A. They're fantastic organizations. In addition to their core missions to serve readers with print disabilities, both get funding to support capacity building, to execute accessible publishing projects, and to conduct research and accessibility audits for publishers. NELS also has a Braille program that is always looking for new books to transcribe to Braille, both digital and physical. In the context of Canadian publishing, NELS could guide publishers through the certification process, check their eBooks, and even help write image descriptions. The NELS Brain Trust is massive and influential leverage it. In the United States, Benetech and Bookshare are doing really great things, um, including the development of a certification process for publisher workflows. The Access Text Network serves as a bridge between publishers and college students. These organizations are the first stop for student disability offices and provide accessible materials to make everyone's job easier. 
And then there's a couple more things I want to point to. Um, so there's some resources on this on the this page here. Where we're pointing to the Inclusive Publishing in Australia um, initiative, the web, the W3C Accessible Maturity Model, the DAISY Consortium, something called APLM, which I'll explain in a minute. And then another thing called the Inclusion Guide with a K instead of a C. And it's a guide, it's the subtitle on that is a kick-ass guide to making literature events accessible to disabled people. It's a fantastic resource as well. The DAISY Consortium has been providing accessible books since the 90s. They continue to provide digital talking books to readers and have recently created a tool called Ace by DAISY for publishers. This is a tool that checks EPUBs for accessibility. DAISY is among the largest contributors in the standard space as well. They offer regular webinars and those are starting up again really soon about eBooks and accessibility. Check their website for a number of great resources, including um, the high level DAISY knowledge base. If you make eBooks in any way, shape or form, the DAISY knowledge base is something, it's a tab you always have open because you're always referring back to it. And then finally, um, this last resource that I'd like to point you to is something called the Accessible Publishing Learning Network. Um, and the URL for that is apln.ca. This site is designed to be a plain language introduction to the world of accessible publishing. It includes a community hub where users can post questions and get answers from experts in the field. If you are new to accessible book publishing, please consider this guide a good starting point. Thank you. In conclusion, the salient point here is that accessibility is a process and something to be striving for continually. It cannot be parked in a silo. It's something to chip away at every day and by every member of the team. Thank you for your time. We're happy to take your questions. And there's our contact information on Twitter. Wonderful, Sphere. Laura, thank you so much. That was an incredibly interesting and informative talk, not least because uh, as a screen reader user myself and an avid book reader, I'm permanently fascinated by all that goes into to making more books available. Uh, Crystal, have we got any questions at all for Laura and Sphere? Yeah, we do have a few. So um, first up, our first question is, um, you mentioned that a few publishers give their book covers text descriptions, yet we um, know that book covers are often an important part of a publishing choice. I know that's, <laughs> that, was, that has been true for me in the past. Uh, do you have any suggestions to help publishers get better at this? Um, I'm happy to take this question. One of the problems is the supply chain. Um, and this is where advocacy really comes into play. Uh, I, I worked at a publisher up until recently, and we had really great image descriptions for all of our book covers, but the supply chain wasn't capable of accepting it. So um, we would embed it in our metadata, we did the best we could, but the way that we distribute content, even um, the, the product listings for print content, doesn't allow for image descriptions. And so and so one of the things I, I would do constantly is advocate with the aggregator and distributors that we use to make a space for that. Um, and, the, and then advocate with vendors as well to make a space for image descriptions. At present, it's just not possible. And I could be wrong, please do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but from what I understand, it's just not possible. The best place to expose things like image descriptions for book covers is on a publisher's own website. And I have yet to see someone doing that effectively. It's and really I have, disappointing. I have a slightly different answer. I will say in ebooks, it's possible to include an image description, but um, I work for a larger publisher than the one Laura worked for. Um, when I advocate for it internally, the answer that I get is that it's an entirely different workflow than image descriptions within the book. Covers are created by marketing, um, and marketing, um, we have. Marketing is a tough nut to crack. I'll just say that with um with accessibility, and um, I mean no um disrespect to people within marketing, but um we've been um uh, uh, most of the work as we started off with is done within production within um a lot of the people who work with websites and things like that, and most people in marketing are just not familiar with accessibility and certainly have never written an image description. 
And there's a, a kind of irony in that really, isn't there? You know, I mean, there are book covers that I can remember since before I lost my sight 20 odd years ago. You know, they, they were they made that much of an impression. I still vividly remember them now. They are such a huge part of, of you know, the, the, the purchasing choice. You know, we say don't judge a book by its cover precisely because we do. We go into bookshops and and do exactly that. And yeah, it seems a little you know, unusual that the marketing teams haven't yet really appreciated that that, that applies to people. <laughs> Even those of us who can't see the book covers in the literal sense, um, there is it, still that immediate impression to be gained. Especially considering how much time goes into designing book covers. Yeah. Right. You yeah, talk. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Crystal, um, anything else? Um, yeah. So um, actually kind of continue on with like, especially mentioning the ebooks. I know, you know, with certain ebooks, they'll have, you know, pictures, you know, within the, you know, in, within the content. And this is a little bit probably, the images very, you know, they, they vary wildly uh, with some of those. And so I just kind of wanted to know, like, what can be done to, to that? And especially the image quality now is very much important for me, but as, you know, you know, being, you know, someone who is, low vision, visually impaired. And sometimes the picture images are like a blob and, and you know, and, and with not having text uh, descriptions, it's kind of like, it's very hard to just kind of like, what am I supposed to be seeing here? So Laura is one of the world's experts in eBooks. So she's probably the best person to answer this. Well, what I would say, um, Crystal, is that, um, this is this is a problem and and I absolutely recognize it. I wish it was more possible to embed SVG in ebooks and and we can do it. It's just that it's not always well supported at the uh, vendor end. There's a variety of reading systems in the world and often we're making ebooks that sort of um, work to the lowest common denominator of functionality um, and survive kind of degradation ac across the reading landscape. And so there's not as much uh, resolution put into those images as possible. And SVGs would make panning and zooming images really easy without any loss of crispness or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But they're not that well supported. And so they are uh, massively underused in ebook development. And that's a problem as well. Um, I think that a lot of people are now designing ebooks to work well on the high res iPads, as well as say um, a low res e-ink device. So there is some, some, you know, some people, I mean, the wide variety that you're seeing means that there are a million publishers who have a million different workflows. Um, but in general, because we have to work toward the less, the least capable devices, it's really hampers functionality. And boy, do I regret it. <laughs> Uh, there's also one other aspect. We are used to, when we look at our phones, looking at things that are developed today, maybe last week. Ebooks um, and books, you know, a, a publisher puts out a book in 2010. Um, it probably is still available today, but the technology changed 10, 15, 30 times since then. The book that I developed for my publisher in 2010 maybe was updated, maybe wasn't. It depends how what the volume of sales was. But the technology that was available in 2010 was very different. So you might have a you, your the topic that you're interested in might not be a bestseller topic, but let's say you're look, reading a math book. Probably the math was captured as images then, and it's really not very high quality images because of what's po what was possible and not every math book is a bestseller. So it sounds a little bit like there's a, a two sorts of disconnect that seem to happen. On the one hand, there is content that's being published with you know good efforts being made for accessibility, but the systems in which it's used and displayed maybe don't support those features like the the, the cover text descriptions. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we've got the reverse problem, which is that the 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 consumer systems have have been updated many times since, but the content itself was maybe 10, 15 years older and not developed yes. so so accessibly. That's so that's tough. The, <laughs> and it's not just that's it's not a real just, challenge. It's not just accessibility where that's an issue. It's right. Different. We also not unlike the web, we're dealing with dozens of systems. So when we test, we might test on twenty or thirty um, endpoints. Wow. <laughs> 
um, going a kind of <laughs> being a little bit more on the kind of image graphics, but we do have a question about um, if you have any more info on making comic books more accessible, especially I, I know, um, you know, I you know, last like really, you know, 10, 15 years, I know there's been a push to put you know, more comic books, you know, digitally. And, and I know there's, I, I've, I, mean, I used to read a lot of comic books. <laughs> and so this is something I'm very, you know, interested in, because I do kind of remember the, the beginning uh, kind of uh, parts of putting comic books, um, you know, online and in digital format and um, kind of, you know, or has things, you know, really uh, progressed from, since then? Um, yeah. Um, this is such a good question. And this is a really fraught area, to be really <laughs> frank. Um, <laughs> Because writing image descriptions for comic books is a very complex and weighty task. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough for us to get people to write image descriptions for the, you know, 10 or 20 images in a monograph as it is. Getting them to write image descriptions for comic books is um, next level. That said, there are some really interesting projects happening at the moment. There is a guy whose name I will never be able to rem rec remember on the spot, I think he's at San Francisco State University, who's doing a lot of research and work into accessible comics. And he has like really interesting things going on. And I, um, I will dig up that link and tweet it later, but he has uh, really great things going on, including things like day long workshops about how to do uh, comic books better, comic books and graphic novels. So there is stuff happening in this space. I'm happy to report. I think that progress is slow but steady. There, there is also work happening in the standard space. A lot of comics have been captured in what we call the fixed layout format, which is just kind of like taking a picture of a page. Um, it looks pretty similar to PDF, and it, it doesn't translate so well to um, to phones, small screens, and it's certainly not usually accessible. Um, but there's a a lot of work happening to attempt to make that more accessible. Um, and this is particularly interesting in the world of comics and manga. Um, and there's also, I don't know if you're familiar with Webtoons, which is a, an approach to digital comics. There's a lot of exploration about how to standardize that. Um, and if things get standardized, at least in some organizations, then they do have to go through an accessibility review. Um, so there's a lot of exploration, like Laura said, happening in this world right now um, because people are getting frustrated with it. And some other bright spots in this area are that there's a lot of legislation <laughs> happening with around accessibility now. So in particular in Europe, if you want to be able to sell things, they have to be, they'll have to be accessible in the coming years. And certainly Europeans do like their comics, especially in France. Is there a bit of a whose responsibility is this? problem with that as well. I, funny enough, I've been reading um, a series of books called Rivers of London by Ben Aronovich, and there's eight or nine books in the series that are, are just typical written novels, but there's there's three or four graphic novels that form part of the same storyline. And I was sort of thinking, oh, wow, you know, I'll never get to, to really read those. And then I started thinking, well, presumably they made it a graphic novel because they didn't want to write it as words. And from there, I suppose, if, if we did make the graphic novels accessible, who, who is actually responsible for writing the description? Should that go back to the author as the, the creator of the work? Or is that something that can be done by their publishing team? Or So this actually becomes, especially when you get into things that are a bit on the artsier side, it, it's probably going to become a rights issue. Mm. Um, when in the world of publishing, rights are a hot topic because when it becomes creative property, yeah. I think in um, the UK, that's called moral rights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it becomes a very touchy topic. Um, when you're writing an image description for something like a bar graph, nobody particularly cares who writes it. <laughs> right. As long as it gets done. When, uh -huh. it's, something, when it's something like like a comic book, manga, uh, uh, anything along those lines, and it truly gets to the heart of what the authorial intent is, it's a it's a much tighter it, it's more tightly controlled. Yeah, so that makes sense. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 
and so another question um, it mentioned in, you know, about kind of creating accessible events and spaces. And, you know, I think this is a very hot topic as, you know, a lot of, you know, events are going back in, you know, in, in person and, you know, wanting to make sure, you know, if it's an in-person event, is it, you know, if it's, you know, a hybrid, if it's, you know, virtual, how, like, you know, resources to make, you know, accessible events and space, especially around, you know, um, literature, book, you know, and, and books. Um, you know, I, I know I've, you know, it's been a while, but I used to love going to bookstores and, and, you know, having my, you know, seeing some favorite authors read their books. And I'll be honest, some of those were, you know, looking back on it, weren't that accessible. <laughs> I mean, the classic image of a crammed, tight bookshop um, with the author in the corner reading from their book, that's, you know, deeply inaccessible to someone on wheels, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, trip hazards aplenty. Um, yeah, so there is work being done in this area, and that inclusion guide, inclusion with a K, not a C, is a really good starting place. That's... Um, and, you know, in my experience, creating accessible spaces doesn't have to be that hard. It really is just a question of being a little bit more thoughtful about choices, like choices of venues, for example, um, and, and making sure that there are, you know, clear paths in and out for a wide variety of people with um, a wide variety of mobilities. Um, it, it, and, and so it just requires a little bit of thinking through. And I think that in general, book launches, for example, are planned at whatever bookshop will have you for nothing because there are shoestring budgets aplenty in this world. Um, so that just, if it just requires you to step back and to think things through a little bit more thoroughly. That's, that's my hot take. Um, BMA want to weigh in. I've never planned a book launch, but I don't think that this is just about book launches and it's not just about no. accessibility either. I'll, I'll give an example. Personally, I'm very short. Um, I spoke at a conference last week and the podium was too high and I couldn't see the audience. So standing there in front of about 100 people, I just said, could somebody get me a step stool? And, you know, uh, presumably it was planned with, you know, having the average five foot nine man as a speaker, but I couldn't see anything. So it's just that kind of planning, um, thinking about, not just your average speaker, presenter, audience member, thinking about everybody. Yeah, I <laughs> I have def I'm also sure and I have dealt with that quite a bit where it's like, okay, I cannot <laughs> second, I can't reach the, you know, I can't reach the podium. I you've given me a chair and my legs are swinging and it's <laughs> very, you know, if I'm supposed to, you know, be on a panel talking for like 90 minutes I am going to that's going to be a bad time so yes <laughs> um yeah book launches it, you know it ain't everything <laughs> thinking about those stores to things um so a question uh, another question that we have is you know you you know you've you both mentioned that you know accessibility is a process like you know, kind of tips about how to get teams started to adapting accessibility process, you know, it, adapting accessibility into their processes. Um, okay, I've, I've definitely have experience doing this. Um, I, I think really the best way to get started is don't expect too much at the outset. Set your expectations realistically. Um, it's, it's about education at the beginning. Um, start talking about it, make some noise. Um, and I, I think that Laura and I both have experience with this. Just start, um, do it surreptitiously. <laughs> you know, do your own thing. Start with formatting your Word documents, formatting your HTML, write your own image descriptions as, at the beginning um, and just get it started, start, talking about it as much as possible, you'll find people who really care at the beginning, you know, you'll find your own band of accessibility lovers and make as much noise as possible and people will join. Yep. I, I, I would add to that, that baby steps, like, you know, a change is incremental and don't be put off and, and, and take it in little chunks. Um, and, you know, eventually 
you do get there and hopefully your work doesn't get undone when you leave or whatever. <laughs> um, but baby steps. Yep, agreed. And it's amazing how much progress you can make taking one small step at a time, isn't it? When you when you look back and you reflect, I think people are often quite surprised by how much has changed and how much they've accomplished, which is good good place to be. Mm-hmm. I'll also add something that I've heard from every person I've worked with in accessibility that, you know, adding just one thing to make things more accessible still helps. Mm-hmm. Yep, it absolutely does. It will certainly help lots of people somewhere, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Great. And on that happy note, uh, we need to bring this session to a wrap. If you are listening or watching in and you enjoyed the session, please do hit the like button on the YouTube video to show Laura and Sphere your appreciation. And while you're there on youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24, why not subscribe so you'll get notifications about all other activities that take place. A reminder that Inclusive Design 24 is a respectful community. You'll find a copy of our code of conduct linked from every page of the ID24 website. ID24 is brought to you with the generous support of all our sponsors who are Entopia, Fable, Barrier Break, TPGI, UX for the Win, Equal Entry, Infoaxia, Intuit, the Law Office of Laney Feingold, Adrian Roselli LLC, and WebAble. Crystal and I will be back with you at the top of the hour for the final talk of the 24 hours of Inclusive Design 24 2022. Before then, Laura, Sphere, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Our apologies for the hiccups that we experienced, but it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.